morning and welcome to Q&A. On the program this Sunday, Bill English's scattergun budget. Will it hit the targets that count, like housing affordability in high-priced Auckland? Also today, how would Labour and the Greens handle our economy if they were in charge? And could they stitch together a union that wouldn't frighten the business world? We talk to journalist and author Marsha Giesen, who charts the ruthless rise of Vladimir Putin and explains why the West should be very concerned about Russia's absolute ruler. We'll take a look back at the week with political editor Corin Dan and discuss the issues with our panel. Political scientist Dr Raymond Miller, former Green MP and activist Sue Bradford, and from the New Zealand Initiative Dr Oliver Hartwich. Good to have your company. Morning, Corin. Good morning, Susan. So the week starting with the Sky City deal, the government happy with the controversial deal, the opposition, well, the Greens, threatening to overturn it. We are calling John Key and Sky City on their bluff. Uh, we can and we will legislate to repeal this dirty deal. But Labour may be not aligned no, with their thinking. No, I think that they understand where the government's coming on this. Uh, they know that the government is thinking, well, there's enough, there are critics, there are people who are uncomfortable about this deal, but maybe the bulk of the population will probably be ambivalent and let it go through, and I think Labour knows that. Now, National didn't want Aaron Gilmore hogging the headlines in Budget Week. On Tuesday, he did the decent thing. The stress of dealing with a media frenzy as I have over the past two weeks is enough to drive anybody out of public office. I am not seeking sympathy with that statement, but I would like to put on the record of the House just how grateful I am to the friends in this House who have expressed support for me personally. So, Corin, when do we say hello to number 59 on National list? At Claudette Hawiti, she should be uh, sworn in when Parliament resumes on the 28th of May. There's a one-week recess. Aaron Gilmore, well, he managed to get a little bit of dignity. He didn't follow through with the Utu promise uh, quite. Um, I think that was a good idea. And, uh, look, it's been a pretty sorry saga, and one feels for him a little bit that it's been a pretty tough ride with that, um, that media scrutiny. Now to the MMP reform, the government saying basically the parties couldn't agree, so no point in trying. But, Corin, you really got the sense they didn't try at all. Oh, this came out of nowhere on Wednesday. I think uh, Judith Collins has probably upset every single academic in the country with the way that she's responded to this. You get the sense that they just didn't try. They need John Banks potentially to come back, bring through a couple of MPs to get them back into government. They may need him. Why would you close off that door? They haven't. This was self-interest. All right, we'll leave the last word to the Prime Minister. Oh, it's not a matter of blame. and There's just a range of views out there. I mean, think about lowering the limit. The National Party didn't want to do that. New Zealand First didn't want to do that. Others would want to. There'll always be a range of issues on those views, but my view is, generally speaking, people are reasonably happy with the way MMP's operated. So that's the end of the matter then? As far as I'm concerned, yeah. The government's on track to deliver a surplus next year, election year, but only just. Bill English calls his fifth budget sensible and responsible, spending well, not spending up, he says. Now that means reprioritising saving here to spend there, with education and health the main beneficiaries. David Shearer called it a blackjack budget, the deck stacked against hard-working Kiwis. Shortly, Corin Dan will ask Labour's David Parker and Greens co-leader Russell Norman what they would do differently. First, here's Corin with Finance Minister Bill English. Thank you very much, Susan. Good morning to you, Minister. If we could start with housing affordability, how will what you've done in the budget help the couple that goes out today, the first home buyer to look for a house, goes to an open home, in what way will this bring down prices and make their task easier to find a house? It sends a, <coughs> a clear signal that the supply of housing into the market, particularly those high growth markets, is going to grow. If you've got more houses uh, being built, uh, there's less pressure on the price at the moment. Uh, Auckland in particular is building historically quite low levels of new housing, almost nothing uh, that's available to lower middle income families. And over the next two or three years, uh, we're going to be working intensively with the council and others who want to, to change that. But that's the point, isn't it? Over the next two to three years, there's nothing that's going to stop house prices rising another 10, 15 per cent compound for the next two years. That, that, that couple are going to find it still very, very difficult to find a house. Well, we're trying to turn around a big ship here. I think the one thing that may have an impact, and we've yet to see, is the pretty clear signal. So developers out there who are sitting on their land, uh, assisted by uh, planning rules that almost guarantee they're going to get large uh, appreciation in the value of that land if they just sit and wait, uh, they're getting a clear signal from the legislation passed, uh, the legislation put into the House on Friday, uh, that the council and the government are willing to act to significantly expand 
uh, the supply of houses. So in Auckland, for instance, in the last three years there's been 12 or 15,000 units built. Uh, in the next three years we're looking at 39,000. But you're, so, you're asking the market to do that. If it doesn't work, what happens in the next two years? Because you've said yourself with uh, big increases in house prices it's very damaging for the economy. What happens in the next two years if you can't bring it under control? Well, we're, we're focusing on the supply of uh, houses, in two years both time, greenfields but what do you do and brownfields. Other than that, if things alongside don't come that, right. Well, alongside that, in the uh, budget, we outlined the agreement we've got the, with the Reserve Bank, where they have some tools that are available uh, to help them ensure that banks don't get carried away with the lending. And then, of course, the Reserve Bank governor has the tool of interest rates. Uh, and these households heading into quite high debt uh, to put by these uh, highly priced houses need to be aware that at some stage the uh, Reserve Bank will increase interest rates, particularly if the housing market keeps growing at quite rapid rates. So, so just to pick up on that, on interest rates, are <coughs> you warning first home buyers not to, or, or to think twice about buying at the moment? No, all I'm, I'm just stating the, the, the fact that uh, interest rates are likely to rise at some stage. I mean, at the moment they're at 50-year lows. Uh, that's giving uh, people a bit of a, you know, they don't want to believe that that's permanent. Uh, the Reserve Bank has the tool of interest rates. They use it through a cycle. Uh, I'm, I'm, the Governor has expressed reluctance to use it at the moment. He hasn't been use, increasing interest rates. So we'll just have to see where that goes over the next couple but, of but years. But everything you've got, everything <clears throat> you've outlined here is stacked against that first home buyer. The, the, the loan-to-value ratios, for example, cutting down the ability for people to have big mortgages, you know, 80% plus loans, that just hammers the first home buyers. And then, as you say, the rising interest rates is also going to put them out of the market. There's nothing for, for that younger generation of Kiwis in what you've announced. Well, there is. What's stacked against first home buyers are planning laws that are explicitly designed to drive up housing, housing values. And that is the case in a number of uh, our faster growth markets. They're explicitly designed to ensure that house prices go up uh, so that they can afford the intensification and the, high, the very high value, high cost urban design that goes with that. Uh, so what's in, what's in here is... Uh, legislation that allows us to give the councils the tools that they need and makes it clear that if that doesn't have some uh, if that doesn't work well uh, then the government has the ability as a reserve power to issue consents itself now that is, this is the a most significant step that a government's taken sure. around working with councils in a long time okay if we just uh, on the on the issue of interest rates too if interest rates go up of course that's going to put pressure on the dollar that is the problem you've got with this economy isn't it you can't afford for interest rates to go up and you've got a hot domestic <clears throat> economy raging away over the next couple of years and it's going to cripple our export sector well, and it, you're right, it is quite a challenge right now, and that, that is why, uh, rather than relying on the interest rate tool, which was what was used last time round, we ended up with 8% uh, uh, OCR and 10% first mortgages. Uh, this time round, we've spent the last two or three years working out what the toolkit is that we need to beat this housing cycle. Well, you said yourself budget, a couple of minutes ago, you argued that, that the, reserve, the Reserve Bank is going to have to raise interest rates. It's inevitable. Well, that's just a matter. Well, the the, uh, the market tells us it'll be sometime late this year or next year. Uh, who knows? It's been for quite a while. People thought interest rates were going to go up, and it's been pushed back and back because of the state of the global economy. All I'm saying to the to the to the homeowners and to the developers is that the steps the government has taken over the last week with the Reserve Bank uh, toolkit and the accords with councils are going to change the market over the next two or three years and it's going to bring more houses to the market. But coming back to the issue of the wider economy, isn't the problem here you've got a very strong, you're going to have a very strong domestic economy, no one disputes that, 2 to 3 percent growth, you've got Auckland houses being built and you've got the Christchurch earthquake. N net exports according to Treasury are going to be a drag on the economy. There's nothing in your budget that's going to make sure that when all that domestic heat goes, <coughs> we take off with exports. Where is that vision? Where is the goal? I don't, uh, Corin, I completely disagree with you there. We've set out uh, earlier this year in six documents the business growth agenda, which sits out, which sets out uh, dozens, in fact hundreds of policy initiatives which we're working on to focus on lifting our long-term potential for earning from the rest of the world. And I think everyone now understands that potential's better than it's been for a couple of generations because of the growing Asian markets. Uh, there isn't one big thing that helps us realise that. There's a whole shift in culture ranging from 
the increased number of companies who now want to come to the public stock market to uh, raise money, uh, through to new rules for how we uh, use our water resources so we don't degrade the environment and water is at the heart of our dairy industry, uh, through to a lot of investment in infrastructure and in skills. So we've laid, that has okay. all got a long-term focus to lift our export capacity. Could I ask you something that, that my predecessor in this job has asked you after just about every budget I think that, that, that you've done? What does this budget do to address uh, inequality in New Zealand? Does it close the gap between the poor and the rich? Uh, it takes us. It takes us in that direction. How? Uh, but you know, closing that gap is is a pretty big challenge. Uh, how it does it is first the thing that uh, the people with the lowest incomes need is a growing economy. So there's opportunities, and the best news in this budget is. Uh, the forecast for more job growth and the fact that we're you know, looking a bit closer to things like the Im nat nationwide impact of the cost. We need to plan. see Second. that businesses pass on those benefits of that growth. Two to three percent growth, sure, great. But are businesses going to pass that on in, the wa in wages to the average Kiwi? Are they going to get three percent wage increases, four percent wage increases? Well, look, some certainly will because it won't be some long Some will, why not all of them? Well, you want to talk to the businesses, that's who decides. The government doesn't set the wages. The point is this, in a growing economy where there's stronger demand for labour, and, and in a few, with, before long we'll be in a discussion about how to find the people to fit in the jobs that are available, particularly in construction and manufacturing. That's the discussion we'll be having. There's also a whole range of measures in the budget focused on the most disadvantaged, who are a long way from being able to step into a job, uh, whose lives are complicated, who are dealing with all sorts of problems and whom the government has served very poorly in the past, governments, uh, through poor housing policy. Uh, so we're fixing that up, insulating their homes, getting the children immunised. Uh, there's been a lot of the discussion about uh, how, who should feed the kids so that they can learn at school, and there'll be more announcements on that. But you see, the thing is, if we have a very strong domestic economy and we have a, a booming property industry, so much of the benefits of that are going to go to people at the top, aren't they? The property investors, the landlords, the people who own capital. It's not going to be evenly distributed, is it? Well, the, in, that, in that context, the measures we put in the budget around housing... Uh, will make a difference to the usual uh, the, the usual cycle, which is as you've described. But the current way that we write rules uh, that restrict the supply of houses into places like Auckland are exactly the things that sh push the benefits to the developers and the financiers and make it very difficult for low- and middle-income families. And I think that housing package is the biggest single step in the budget to help income inequality. Sure. Can I ask you a couple of quick questions on the issue of Meridian Energy? Um, how are you going to get enough New Zealand investors to invest in this company? Uh, when you struggle with Mighty River Power, you're going to need a lot more to get 85%. Can you guarantee you'll get 85% New Zealand ownership of that company? Well, look, we didn't struggle with Mighty River Power. It's got by far the largest share register on the New Zealand Stock Exchange, and 100, 115,000 New Zealanders, uh, individual New Zealanders, put their, put their names in for shares. But Meridian is quite a bit bigger. Uh, we'll be working hard to uh, excite the interest of individual investors. I think a lot of them will put off with the long political discussion around Mighty River Power. But we've found more and more uh, New Zealanders... Uh, have got interested in investment, partly because of the high profile of the Mighty River discussion, but also they want to, uh, as interest rates on their deposits keep dropping, uh, they, they're looking for other opportunities for putting their savings. Sorry, Minister, I have to go, and, uh, but just very quickly, is that a yes or a no you can get 85% guarantee? Uh, as we've always said, it's not a guarantee, it's our target, and a Mighty River Power, we've so achieved it, and Meridian, we are going to go really hard to get 85%. OK, I'll take that as a maybe. Uh, Finance Minister Bill English, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Still to come, David Parker and Russell Norman with their take on the budget and what they think needs to be done. And uh, absolute power, That's, uh, we're going to talk about that also soon. One. Right, we've heard the government view. Time now to hear from Labor's finance spokesman, David Parker, and Greens co-leader, Russell Norman. They are with Corin. Thank you very much, Susan. And David Parker, I'll start with you. The government's uh, reiterated their debt focus in this budget, didn't they? They've said basically they want to uh, keep the priority on right through to 2020. Government debt, not New Zealand debt. Government yes. debt, yes. Yep, yep. Can Labor agree to that? 
Yeah, well, we think we should be back in surplus 2014, 2015. I don't think this is a debate about austerity versus government spending. It's about whether you make the structural reforms in the economy so that you get away from this two-speed economy, which currently has speculators in Auckland doing well and the productive economy not. Unemployment still over 7%. Maori and Pacific Island unemployment 15%. Got a two-speed economy around the country with some regions stagnating and others not doing well. You've got exporters struggling while speculators flourish. Sure. And we'll have that debate, but I need yeah. to get some answers for you on, on these issues because they are important in terms of the debt and the, and the government spending. Will you commit to the to their track of government spending which is coming down and their focus on debt, that 2020 target? Yeah, we have, we have said that we will balance the budget by 2014-2015. We get there in a slightly different way in that we gather a little bit more tax from the most wealthy. We use that to bring forward universal Kiwi Saver, which costs money, and an R&D tax credit. And we also gather a bit more tax over time from a capital gains okay. tax, although that's slow, slow to build. Ru Russell, Norman, no sorry, David, I could come to you on this question. Russell, um, would you agree to that spending profile that the government has said? I mean, for example, a billion dollars in the next budget, would you restrict spending promises to a billion dollars? Well, we'll be putting out our tax policies through next year um, and obviously the projections change over time so we'll see next year how it goes. But obviously the much bigger picture is that under National's economic plan, uh, New Zealand will borrow $61 billion more over the next five years according to the numbers in the budget. So it is a massive borrowing plan And, and would you government. borrow less? Well, in terms of... In terms of New Zealand's national position, I think it's very important to distinguish between the government books and the, and the nation's books. In terms of New Zealand's national position, because we're currently at a, we're a loss-making company of $10 billion a year, under National's plan, the losses will increase to $17 billion a year. The current account deficit increases to $17 billion a year by 2017. In order to cover that, um, National, basically, the plan is for New Zealand to borrow another $61 billion so that our net debt by 2017 is $208 billion. This is a disastrous budget for New Zealand and we need to change track. David Parker, though, the government is for, the Treasury is forecasting some pretty good growth, 2 to 3 per cent. They have got the books in order. The IMF's happy. Standard & Poor's are happy. They've set things up nicely, haven't they? Uh, a third of their growth comes out of Christchurch. Apart from that, it's pretty modest. The problem, as Russell correctly identifies, is that the growth is in the wrong parts of the economy. This is, again, house price-led, debt fueled consumption growth. All right, OK, I'll stop you there. Let's get some solutions then. What would you do the to change the, that? The most important thing for New Zealand is a capital gains tax. We have people investing on the basis of a tax bias rather than productive jobs uh, that we need in and our And I'll economy. stop you there. Russell Norman, you agree? Capital gains tax? You both agreed on that one? Yeah, excluding the family home, it's one part of the solution, but obviously you need a broader range of package that focus on the tradable sector and supporting the tradable sector so we can trade our way out of this terrible debt position Nationals put us in. All right, and then we come to the export part of it. Gov you're, you're the last government. Governments from for years have been talking about growing exports as a percentage of the economy. No one's been able to do it. Well, this government came saying they were going to rebalance it and they were going to cure the problem. Actually, the, the economists would agree that you, the most important thing is getting the tax signal right. You need more savings. Yes, yesterday, Bill English was saying the most successful thing in New Zealand's KiwiSaver. Well, it's a Labor Party initiative. We say that we need to universalise that and then gradually grow the amount of savings in it. You need an R&D tax credit. You need the various other measures to encourage investment in the regions and in productive output rather than in speculative housing. I think it's astounding that the central uh, part of this government's budget is a planning initiative and it's only a minor planning initiative that both the uh, Auckland City Council and the Labour and the Greens have been calling for for months, which is to implement the Auckland plan change. Russell, what would you do on housing? We've heard, obviously, we know a lot about Labour's Kiwi build policy to build houses. Um, what do you propose in order to solve our housing problem? Well, you've got to look at both demand side and supply side. So we've got demand side issues around investment properties and the tax incentive. Um, so capital gains tax, excluding the family home, is part of changing the tax signal, as well as also looking at the losses and, and how those losses are accounted for around investment property. You've also got to take into account the overseas demand. There's different reports about the size of it, but the Hong Kong government, for example, has introduced measures to try to constrain the overseas demand. Um, so that's important as so well. So just stop you there. So that is actually restricting foreign owners buying New Zealand houses, something I think Tony Alexander, BNZ economist, has, has mooted, hasn't he?
Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it might be restricting or it might... What Hong Kong did is they put a 15% surcharge um, effectively on, on non-residents buying property to try to basically turn down the tap a little bit to take some of the heat out of it. And then on the supply side, I mean, we support the supply side measures that Labor's talking about. The, probably what we would say is it needs to be medium density. I think Bill English is wrong when he says that medium density, high quality housing is more expensive than urban sprawl. Urban sprawl is very expensive in the long term because you've got to pay for all the infrastructure to get out there and then all the energy costs when everyone's got to drive across town at oil um, when you know, you're paying two bucks a litre for sure. petrol. So you've got to look at the long-term costs around that. But you, the most important thing actually is to look at the tradable sector. What are we doing for the primary sector in terms of owning more of the value chain into China, for example? What are we doing in terms of manufacturing and government procurement? What are we doing to develop the ICT sector, such as a second cable that would really help our ICT sure. sector get away? David Parker, uh, foreign investment, would, do you agree with the Greens? Would you look, would Labor look at a policy that restricted foreign ownership of, say, residential property in New Zealand? No, we haven't said that we should restrict ownership. Is it a good idea? Uh, it's not our policy. We think we should do it. Okay, no, it's not your policy, but is it, is it worth looking at? <laughs> uh, well, look, we, we consider all good ideas. We have actually said we should uh, restrict overseas ownership of farmland because we don't want to drive the price higher there. One of the problems in New Zealand is we've actually got very poor data as to how much foreign ownership there is of residential land because it's not gathered by anyone. That's where you need to start is gathering that data and see how big a problem is. But, the, the, but you're not going to cure these problems with house prices until you deal with the underlying drivers of rampant house price inflation. Poor tax signal, rising inequality where some people can afford 10 houses and other people can afford none. It, hasn't what Russell just talked about here with foreign investment highlight an issue between Labor and the Greens when it comes to the economy. There are many people, rightly or wrongly, in the, in the business community that are fearful of the Greens telling Labor what to do in government. They are worried about the Greens. Have you, and have you both, been communicating with the business community? Because whether it's justified or not, there could be investment capital well, flight. The first thing I would say is in, uh, in defence of Russell and some of the accusations that are made is this is racked up by the National Party and our opponents. You know, the Greens and, uh, and Labor are very aligned on things like a neutral taxing signal uh, doing things right so that we improve manufacturing and productive output in New Zealand. Uh, you know, the difference is Have around... you communicated that, though, to the business community? Are you talking to them? Because we saw what happened with Helen Clark in 99. The business community went cold. Well, actually, Helen Clark ran three elections in a row, so I don't But know she that... backed off. Uh, no, she didn't. What? Well, she backed off in terms of her approach towards the business community. Look, I have to come to Russell on this. Not yet. Yeah, well, so what's your response so to that? Sure, sure. So since the, since the budget, I've done four business um, uh, breakfasts and lunches, um, talking to business groups. Um, if you think about, I mean, the way I try to think about it is if you think about the non-tradable sector, right, we need to drive efficiency through the non-tradable sector. That's what NZ Power is all about, right? It's about driving down the price of power for households and businesses. Likewise, Kiwi Bank in the financial services sector, it's about trying to reduce the cost of the financial services sector for New Zealand businesses. So some of the things that we introduced are unpopular with certain sectors within the business community, like electricity companies, obviously. But in terms of rebalancing the New Zealand economy so that the tradable sector can get away and succeed, driving down electricity prices is a great thing. So, of course, we'll upset those in the non-tradable sector who are making profit gouging, in, in my opinion, right? Um, but that doesn't mean that everybody thinks it's a bad thing. The exporters and manufacturers said NZ Power is a great idea because if they can get cheaper power, they can compete overseas better. So you've got the, the business community do you, quite but, I mean, Russell, do, you, do you regret perhaps talking about money printing? I mean, at a, a, a year or so ago, the economy, the economic situation was looking a bit more dire. Now we're looking at two to three percent growth. That would, is that still an appropriate policy response <coughs> in this environment? So, well, well, let me try a different picture on you, Corinne. Like, OK, I'm the Minister of Finance. I've just announced my plan for my business, which happens to be New Zealand Inc. The plan involves $10 billion in losses this year and increasing annual losses to $17 billion in four years' time. Do you think that is a successful plan? If you were a shareholder in this company and the Chief Financial Officer said to you, that's my plan, I'm going to fund it by borrowing another $60 billion, do you really think that is a successful business plan for New Zealand? Because no, I the, don't. No, and the point is... You may be right, you may be wrong, but the, some big chunk of the business community is, for whatever reason, very fearful of that, David Parker. They are fearful. Right well, the answer to that is vote Labor. <laughs> you know, look, 
I, I, I th you know, the, the divides in politics are not enormous. We're not, we're, you know, you've got someone talking about Vladimir Putin next week. If you had Vladimir Putin, you should be worried. But yet we have <laughs> Owen Joyce, uh, Stephen Joyce, uh, coming out and saying when we do something, they compare us to him or to Stalinism or North Korea. Look, you know, there is a proper debate to be had in New Zealand as to what structural reforms are needed to get over these long-term problems of the current account deficit, which makes us poor every year. It's going in the wrong direction, and there is nothing. There's absolutely nothing in this budget that fixes it. David Parker, Russell Norman, we have to leave it there, but thank you very much for a great discussion. discussion. Cheers. Thank you. All right, still to come, the panel's going to get stuck into the budget and the state of the economy. And I ask his biographer about this small and vengeful man, yes, Vladimir Putin, how he has shaped Russia in his own image. Time to welcome the panel, Dr Raymond Miller from Auckland University, former Green MP and activist Sue Bradford, and Dr Oliver Hartwich, who's director of the New Zealand Initiative. It's a new ideas shop for economic policy, replacing the Business Roundtable and the New Zealand Institute. Very nice to have you all here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let's start with the big one, housing. And Oliver, I'll start with you on that. Uh, Bill English says we're sending a very clear signal. We're dealing with the supply side of it. And the Reserve Bank has tools. Interest rates will go up. Is it going to make any difference? Are they doing enough to cool down Auckland's overheated housing market? I believe it is a good start. It will probably make a difference because it shifts expectations, <laughs> just as Bill English has mentioned. People have to come to the point that they realise that they shouldn't just sit on land, not develop it. They should actually bring this land to the market and build the houses that this country need because we've got a big affordability issue in this country. It is good the government's finally addressing it. So what more could they do? Um, heaps more. I mean, this, this budget does nothing for low-income people in Auckland or anywhere else who badly need housing right now. It's a disgrace um, because his talk about opening up land in Auckland does nothing at all for people who are desperate for houses now. We need, we need state houses. He says built. they're insulating houses. He said they are adding room they've, onto houses. They, they're, they're building something like um, 3,000 extra bedrooms onto state houses. They're talking about bedrooms now, not houses. 500 more two-bedroom houses. This is over several years. Is. That is a drop in the bucket inside Auckland until we have a massive commitment to state and community sector social housing build in Auckland and in other parts of the country. Nothing will change for unemployed people, for beneficiaries and low-wage workers who can't afford either the commercial rents or the... Um, the prices of houses in Auckland and elsewhere. Um, this is ludicrous. The, those 39,000 houses, if they're built, and there's no guarantees of that, but if they're built, the price of them is likely to be like Hobsonville or out in South Auckland where they're building houses. Now, you're lucky to get in for 600,000. That does nothing to change anything for the sort of people that I work with. So did we, Raymond, hear any alternative from the Greens and from Labor that would provide cheaper housing? Well, of course, they're hoping that capital gains tax will do the trick. Of course, that's not a very popular uh, uh, policy for voters. Anything that involves tax, and particularly tax on investments and so on in housing, is not popular. But the government is playing catch-up, really, on this housing issue because it's only a few months ago that Labour came out with a policy of 10,000, 100,000 houses in 10 years. And, and the government was basically saying that the market will sort things out. And, of course, it's become clear that the market isn't sorting things out and the government is intervening. Um, I really commend to viewers uh, an article by John Armstrong yes, in Saturday's um, Herald because he points out that, of course, the government is, is, is really contemplating some pretty heavy interventionism particularly in places like Auckland. Um, the sort of thing that, if it were Labour that were proposing this, would be considered to be state socialism. But as we know, the government is quite, national government is quite capable of heavy interventionism. And what they want to do, of course, is intervene where councils are acting too slowly in increasing the number of, res in, in passing resource consents yep. and in opening up land. Going that land there. So, so, that's, so, so it'll be very interesting to see whether, whether or not they are, at this late stage, really able to do anything, for t particularly for first home owners. Oliver, what was interesting, I think, from Russell Norman is the suggestion of some sort of restriction around foreign ownership. Is that going to have any sort of real impact? Of course not, because in the end, if you've got foreign ownership, foreign investors in the housing market, 
they are buying property, but the properties are not kept empty. There will still be New Zealanders living in them. So that is not the solution to the housing problems. The housing problem can only be solved if we get really rid of some planning rules that hold back the housing market, because at the moment we don't really have a market. The market is heavily regulated, and we do not have incentives for councils to actually go for growth. At the moment we are holding them back. We are not really helping them with their infrastructure needs when it comes to new development. We should really be tackling this um, issue on the supply side. We so what we saw yesterday, we saw you know the House under urgency debating this and, the, and this new rules coming through. Is that going to have this sort of impact you're talking about? Well, as I said, it's the first step. I think what we really need to do is we need to make sure that councils go for growth, that they are properly compensated for infrastructure spending. We really have to simplify planning rules because we actually have to bring more houses onto the market. We can only solve this problem on the supply side because the demand is already there. We've got a young population, an ageing population, a growing population. We have kids. So unless you really want to deport people and solve the problem there, you have to build more houses. That's the only way you can really solve a shortage by building more homes. Did you see, Raymond, anything in there to Corin's very good question that will address inequality? No, and um, it's interesting that almost liturgically they come up with uh, the, the, a series of things that the government is actually doing, <laughs> almost beginning with home insulation, which I understand was actually a green initiative. Yeah, that's uh, right. But the, the government quite They've sensibly... They've actually cut the funding for home insulation. It's a load of old bollocks that, that it's been yeah. increased. They've cut the funding, but of course, as usual, any government makes it sound like a... It's more targeted, the funding, though. It's more it? targeted, yeah. and, the, and the, some of it's cut. So a lot of people currently working and helping yeah. to home and insulate houses are going to lose their jobs, actually. But, yeah, but I do think <laughs> the government realises this is potentially a very important issue um, for next year, the whole question of poverty and things like uh, food in schools. But it's not, it doesn't just affect the people who themselves are poor, but a lot of fair-minded New Zealanders, middle New Zealanders, uh, just don't like to see the amount of poverty that, that we currently have in New Zealand, and particularly as it affects small children. And Sue Bradford, I think that is the point. Most New Zealanders are horrified at the thought of any child being hungry at school in the morning. That's right, and um, poverty is only getting worse in this country every day, and it's being deliberately created by this government and its policies, and this budget... Deliberately created? What government in their right mind would deliberately create uh, This poverty? government it does it every day, and this budget absolutely does it. I mean, things like saying all state tenancies will now be renewable. Has, we've completely lost the concept that anyone has housing security, even the most needy people in this country. As soon as people, people start people just recycling people, people in and out of state mechanic. housing, on, out of very low paid work and into welfare and back from welfare into very low paid work, no commitment to job creation, no commitment to um, state house building that will do anything to solve the housing crisis, no commitment to a welfare system that will actually treat people fairly and give families enough money to live on. This budget is driving inequality, driving poverty deeper and deeper and creating a millionaire's playground for New Zealand. I think, I think to, to be absolutely fair, I think the government is, is, recognises this problem. The government has been dealing with this problem. It is a major problem. Uh, Christchurch, uh, re redevelopment in Christchurch and a number of other initiatives will help in terms of youth employment in particular. I think we can be positive about a lot that this budget actually uh, signals. Well, agreeing. Like what? What well, is positive? Well, <laughs> there are quite, there's nearly a billion dollars worth of new initiatives and, and, and they are spread across the economy. It's a very political budget because uh, the, the minister, the minister realises that, uh, that next year is election year and even although he is naturally inclined towards being cautious, being pragmatic, being careful, uh, nevertheless I think he realises that it has to, he has to cover all bases. Where though, Oliver? is our export-led recovery that we have been promised for a number of years. Well, it's difficult, of course, as long as the dollar is as high as it is. Um, but on the other hand, I mean, the economy is growing by 25 to 3% over the next few years. That actually makes New Zealand one of the best-performing economies in the developed world. And I think that's the only chance we have to really generate that export growth that we would all like to see. The government can't legislate for that, but we can create an environment in which economic growth happens. And I think the government is doing just that. And on your poverty point, I mean, it's just ludicrous to say that the government is creating poverty. We're actually trying to get people out of welfare dependency back into work because that's the best chance for these people to actually have to have a decent income again and to progress in life rather than staying on the welfare rolls. That is so true, but how is that happening with Bill English's unrelenting focus on work with the government's welfare reforms when the sick, the disabled, the injured, the sole parents with young children are being driven back into the workforce to compete for the same few jobs as desperately unemployed and other low-wage workers and the government has zero commitment to job creation. So people are just being recycled 
recycled between the welfare system and very low paid poor and secure well, jobs. Just not what true. is the point of that? That's just not true. When you've got an economy growing at two and a half or three percent, that's decent growth and that will actually create the jobs that these people will need. And I'm agreeing with you here. We need decent targeted support for people who really need it. But for all other people, we should actually focus on getting them back into the labor force. But what if the jobs aren't there? The jobs simply aren't there for so many people who well, are desperate jobs to work growth. right If you look now. into the budget papers, you can see that there are jobs being created in the economy. We've actually created jobs, loads but of jobs. But very few. Every Treasury broadcast, every uh, forecast and every budget over the last few years has been a, t a very low percentage um, has actually been created uh, compared to what they've predicted. I don't trust any of Treasury's budget predictions on unemployment. <laughs> you only have to look at them to see that. I'm sure you have I, seen I'm, this. I'm pretty sure you can still create <laughs> enough jobs for these people. One of the ways in which you can actually create exports is to grow these jobs at home because part of our export jobs is tourism. There's an enorm enough opportunity in tourism to build a thriving tourism economy and I think these jobs will be created in the tourism industry in part. And fair to say also, I think, Oliver, education, there is an emphasis, this government, as others have, on education, which of course helps people get out of the poverty trap to some extent. Oh, Absolutely. but now they, one of the worst things in this budget for education, um, people over 40 are now restricted to only three years of su potential support for a degree. So it's like a bachelor's degree is as far as you can go. No postgraduate training or education for people over 40 anymore with, any f with government support. Isn't that terrible? At a time when we're being encouraged to be retrained and re-educated. Oliver? Well, I think that the government has also shown that they are committed to education. We just have to see, uh, but, uh, for example, what uh, Gabriel McClough, the Treasury Secretary, says about teacher quality and if actually increasing the quality of our teaching profession. I think that's the way to go. We have a lot of uh, work to do. By and large, the New Zealand education system performs well, but we know we've got pockets of deprivation in the country, and that's unfortunately where we've got the biggest education needs. And a very generous student loans scheme. Even though they're now talking about arresting those who don't pay at the border, it's still a very generous scheme. Yes, a high proportion of the money that goes to tertiary education goes to students. Uh, and that is both good and bad. The, 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 the good thing about it, of course, is that it gets students the opportunity to have a tertiary education. But, of course, universities are struggling uh, with underfunding. And, and really, you know, when you want a world-class world university, you have, to, you have to pay for it. And uh, we spend so much less than, say, Australia does on its university education. Um, and, and really, I think that's something that will need to be addressed very soon because we do offer world-class education here in New Zealand. Very good. We will leave it there with the panel back with you shortly. Up next, how much nerve do you need to expose Russia's absolute ruler? We're going to discuss the dangers of the world of Vladimir Putin with Marsha Geeson, his highly unofficial biographer. On one. We all know a bit about Vladimir Putin, the macho posturing self-promotion and the dark side, the unexplained deaths of his critics and whistleblowers, his iron grip on power. Marsha Geeson has written an unofficial and highly critical biography charting his breathtaking rise to absolute power. Despite the risks, Marsha still lives in Moscow and she is with us this morning. Very good morning to you. Hello, good to be here. How would you describe the man's personality? The man's personality? Well, um, he has actually said a lot about himself if you listen to him and he portrays himself as a thug his biography that his only official biography his only series of official interviews that came out when he was first rising to power uh, is actually a series of stories about fights that he got into as a school child as a student as a KGB officer because as a student it was fascinating wasn't it he he was a a young man who dreamed of becoming a KGB agent most young boys would have been dreaming of being cosmonauts and he's dreaming of being a KGB agent which says a lot about him I think absolutely uh, from what I can tell his father was a KGB agent I mean we know he served in the NKVD which is the precursor to the KGB for a short time but he seems to have never left and I think Vladimir Putin was quite literally born into the KGB and born for the KGB and that is something he takes, he has taken and taken forward in his whole political career, hasn't he? That way of operating. Absolutely. He thinks that the KGB, especially the late KGB of the late Soviet Union, was the best institution that ever created. And uh, he has done everything to turn Russia into as much of the KGB as he can. Can you give me a couple of specific examples of, of things he has done that really reflect that? Well, he's turned it into secretive, closed. Uh, highly con vertically controlled, or at least aspiring to a high vertical control institution, um, that's become very dysfunctional, very much like the late KGB. He's very rich too. How's he managed to uh, amass uh, 40 billion 
dollar fortune. It's enormous, isn't it? Right. Well, we don't know whether the 40 billion number is, is right or uh, wrong. In fact, I don't think anybody, including Putin, knows how much money he has. Um, that is Putin, because it's so large? Uh, because it's large and because his, uh, the ownership structure is complex, to say the least. Most of his assets are parked with oligarchs, you know, the rich Russians who are dependent on him and have to keep their assets, uh, these assets free, uh, uh, safe. And some of the assets are in bearer shares of Swiss companies. So it's a question of physical possession of the papers that, that document the, uh, the companies. And we don't actually know how much of that he would be able to keep if he were ever to lose power. And he clearly worries that not much. We saw last year, we saw riots, which, well, certainly demonstrations against Putin, yet he manages to hold on to power and, he, and, and he's managed to change the whole structure that he just seems to jump between the two most powerful jobs, doesn't he? It's not particularly original. I mean, dictators have used that sort of tactic for generations, both the jumping from office to office uh, business um, and the crackdown that Putin has instituted since coming back into office uh, officially in May of last year. So it's been for a year we've been living through an extreme crackdown. We also see his critics killed when we saw a, a very, very high-profile case of the poisoning I in the UK. Polonium. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how, where does that, how high does that start? Those, where do those orders begin, in your belief? I believe that he has created a system in which a whole uh, category of people is outside the law, is unprotected. It's open season on critics, on the opposition, on journalists, on activists. Uh, I don't think that Putin personally orders most of those killings. He personally behaves in a way that makes it clear that those killings are all right. Are you concerned for your own safety, having written such a critical book on Vladimir Putin? I would be crazy not to be concerned about my own safety, uh, but I'm less, I, I think I have less reason to be concerned than many other people. Uh, I, am, I have a high profile, I have a lot of publicity in the West. Some uh, earlier murders have taught them that um, bad publicity in the West is uncomfortable. And, um, you know, I, I know people who have been attacked, who have been beaten, and who have been killed. And so I, um, I think part of what the, the reason that this was possible is because they didn't have the kind of publicity that I, that I have. And so you think your public persona gives you some protection, actually? Some. Doing, yeah, exactly, because you have been spied on, haven't you, that you're aware of? Well, that's, that's normal. I mean, that's, that's sort of standard fare for anybody in the opposition. To, to, to be spied on to a man up. To have your phone bugged, to have somebody hang out outside your door, to have people follow you. Yeah, that's, that's standard. We'll live with that. How unnerving is that? Uh, it can be extremely unnerving. The first time it happened to me when someone was standing outside my, my apartment door for several days on end, um, I found it incredibly intrusive and it made me very, very nervous and paranoid. And I had to leave the country for a little bit to just sort of air out. Um, I've learned not to notice it. So it's just become normal? It's just something that, that, that exists parallel to my life. I don't feel like it affects it. How much of a threat is Putin to the Western world, to the rest of us? Well, think about it. It's uh, one-sixth of the uh, Earth's landmass. It has more nuclear warheads than any other country except for the United States. Uh, and it, it is in possession of a large part of the world's supply of oil and gas. And it is run by a ruthless dictator who openly shows and tells that uh, he is vengeful and has contr uh, trouble controlling his temper. How long will he stay in power? I mean, you're talking about a man who will stop at nothing to keep it, really, aren't you? Uh, uh, he, I think he's in the last stages of his regime. Those last stages, those agonizing and miserable last stages can last a while. Uh, but, but this is the final act. He no longer has popular support. Uh, he has had to resort to a crackdown to keep power. Now it's a question of how stable oil prices remain uh, and whether there's an economic crisis that causes the whole thing to boil over. Um, that could happen in a year. It could happen in five years. Yeah. Yeah. So hard to predict, but you would be predicting a violent, some sort of violence to the ending of Vladimir Putin? Well, the, the more and the tighter he, he puts on the screws, uh, the more pressure there is on people and the less the outcome, uh, the, the, the less the probability of a peaceful outcome. Yeah. Now, in the past week or so, we've seen Russia expelling an American diplomat. Quite a bizarre case, the, the blonde wig and, and, <laughs> and all of that. What is your take on that particular expulsion? 
Um, I think somebody has been watching the Americans, which is a wonderful... Uh, All the television American shows. Television series. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it did actually resonate with that, didn't it? What's the feeling in Russia, and there was a lot of publicity in the West about uh, Pussy Riot, what is, what's the feeling in there about, about that? Um, it's a very important case, uh, first of all because it sort of signaled the beginning of the crackdown. Because these women uh, went to jail for two years for staging a 40 second peaceful protest in the form of a song. And they got two years of jail for, them, for, for that. It also was the beginning of this culture war that is part of the crackdown. Uh, basically what Putin has been doing is he's been trying to appeal to his shrinking base. Uh, of Russian nationalists uh, and conservatives by showing everyone else to be other, to be, to be foreign, to be different. So uh, Pussy Riot, which has been portrayed as an enemy of the Russian Orthodox Church, which it's not, uh, has been very much a, a pawn in that particular game. And, uh, and it's, 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 it's a signal case. You met Putin once. I did. What did you think? In person? Um, well, it was, it was amazing because I had written the book by the time I met him, which he didn't know. He hadn't read the book at that He hadn't read assumes. the book, and in fact, he clearly hadn't been briefed on the fact that I'd written the book, uh, which just actually goes to show how dysfunctional the Russian government is right now. But, you know, I felt like I was going to meet a character I'd made up. <laughs> and I'd spent, I'd spent years poring over, over every speech he'd ever given and uh, watching every video interview that he'd ever given. Uh, so I had a very clear image of him, but I was kind of hoping to be surprised. I was hoping to feel something, because uh, um, the book I wrote and the character that, I, that emerged is, is very two-dimensional. He's very flat. He's uninteresting. Um, and, um, well, he's very flat. He's uninteresting. <laughs> uh, uh, he, is, um, he was bad at the meeting. He, was, he had not been briefed. Uh, he pitched it all wrong. Uh, he thought he was charming me, but um, he was making thuggish jokes, as he usually does. Very good to talk to you. Fascinating. Nash Thank Gason, you. thank you so much for your time this morning. Raymond, if I can throw it over to you. Interesting, you know, we hear about a democracy wound back, if you like, uh, by, by Putin. In our own uh, democratic processes this week, MMP, the review came through and filed in the bottom drawer. <laughs> Absolutely. And this, of course, is one of those issues where we, um, we saw uh, a lot of people very outraged at what had happened because it was quite clear that uh, the government was the one who initiated the referendum uh, in 2011. The government promised as part of that referendum process that if a majority voted to retain MMP, there would be a review. Now, that was the government that said this. Um, and, and, and the review was held. And I suppose its major recommendation was that the coattails pr provision uh, be, be abolished. Now, uh, uh, the minister this week made the announcement that nothing would happen. And uh, really, um, it, her story, is, it, it, in, in my view, is not that credible. Because, quite frankly, um, uh, e either, either she negotiated uh, and, and couldn't get her own party to support her on the recommendation that the coattails provision be abolished, um, or she was not very good at trying. Um, and I, I'm not sure, I, I, my own feeling is that what happened was that National and ACT and United Future had from the very beginning decided that this would not be something they would adopt. And we've gone through nearly seven months of waiting for the government uh, to come out with it, its answer. Now one of the problems with all of this is I went around the country in 2011 talking to groups and there were a lot of people who said well I, I you know I, I'm not really that keen on MMP uh, but they were assured that there would be a review and that at the end of that review changes would take place so really this is a breach of trust um, this is treating the voters in a rather high-handed way it's almost should democracy be in the hands of politicians Oliver you know <laughs> because they will act with self-interest well, of course, I mean, that's why they're politicians, and democracy should be a rule of the people. I agree with you and um, your criticism of process, but I would also say that maybe the reason why they didn't in, in the end really change MMP was because it's simply not the right system to start with. I come from a country that's been operating under MMP for 60 years, and I can tell you that opinion polls show that to the present date, about 50% of Germans still don't understand how it really works. And I presume that's probably the same pr uh, problem here. I think MMP as a system is very complex. It probably cannot really be made to work. And if you want a system that delivers effective government by the people, for the people, of the people, I think we should probably consider going back to first past the post. So? 
Um, well, I'm a, remain a total supporter of MMP. I have found it hard to take the glee with which um, Labor and the Greens have, have said have condemned National for its position, especially the Greens, given that back in 99 uh, the Green Party nearly only came in through the percentage and, and Jeanette having a seat in the end that the didn't coattails. happen. Yeah. So they've come a long way from their history um, and I think there is something quite um, undemocratic in wanting to, to have that high percentage, that high 4% threshold. So I'm not a supporter of the conclusions of the review, but at the same time I agree with um, other people here that the approach the government has taken has been quite um, over, overbearing and arrogant and bodes not very well for the constitutional, constitutional review, review, which I'm also very concerned mm -hmm. about. Um, but of course any government that has the numbers can do what it's like and that's how parliaments are, whichever mm -hmm. system. And that's a fair point, Raymond, isn't it? Constitutional review, mm -hmm. probably what they will look at is the four-year term, because we know National is keen on yes. that. The rest of it, again, in the bottom drawer. Yes, I mean... The place of the treaty, for instance, in our constitution, whether we should have a written constitution, whether we should have a smaller or a larger parliament, there are a number of major issues being considered by this constitutional review, and in good faith, they're going to the people of New Zealand and saying, what do you think? If it's the government's intention to put it in the bottom drawer and not even look at it, or to take to cherry-pick one issue, that is the four-year parliamentary term, which politicians really do like because it means they don't have to go to the people so often, then I think, that again, we're seeing a bit of a travesty because really people have the opportunity and they expect that the politicians will listen. And if they don't listen, then I think that they will be punished for it. And it's all parties, as you made the point, so isn't it? It's not just national, they all... No, the self-interest runs self right through the party system. I yeah. mean, everyone in this case was behaving out of self-interest. The only area where you could say self-interest was not evident was the voice of the people who, through the review process, said these are things we think should be changed. And what I was worried about was that whatever National came back with, there wouldn't be a proper process of consultation, submission, because, for example, should it be 4% or 3%? I mean, like, to me, that's a really huge issue. Yeah. Um, it becomes irrelevant now because it's not going to be debated. But I was very <coughs> concerned about the potential lack of public participation after this. The, the irony, of course, with self-interested politicians is sometimes it doesn't work because if uh, John Key had really hard, uh, thought about it hard before the last election, he would have campaigned for return to first person because it would have almost secured him a third term. And I think sometimes politicians may be self-interested, but actually there's quite more goals. I think John Key realised long before the last election that first past the post was something that was not going to win majority <laughs> supports in New Zealand. If he and he's a pragmatic politician. He quickly realised the best thing to do was keep quiet on the issue and yeah. let the people yes. speak. I think if he had campaigned for it, he would have had a chance to push it through. But anyway. Very good. All right, up next, some of the lighter moments of the week with the panel and Corin. We're back in just a moment. On one. Welcome back, panellists, and Corin also joining us. Well, to some of the more unusual moments of the week, Winston Peters livened up Budget Day a bit with some props to get him noticed. It's a bit like this. They have to run faster and faster to stay in the same place. Now, we didn't quite see it in the shot there, Corinne, but there is a, a, a mouse, not a real one. Not a real one. But a um, fake mouse in there. Winston Peters, probably along with a lot of the opposition, struggling to th for things to really grip hold of on that budget. I mean, it didn't upset a lot of people, the budget, but it didn't also, you know, it wasn't that exciting. So it was quite hard for the opposition to attack, I think. Yes, I mean, uh, Winston threatened to call in the serious fraud office, <laughs> which I thought was quite funny. But I think that you're absolutely right, Corin. It's one of those budgets that uh, David Parker, Winston Peters and so on would find very difficult to really lay into in yeah. a big way. All right, uh, Judith Collins has been quite, proven quite adept on Twitter. But when a follower asked her what she'd do if she found a turtle lying on its back in the desert, she was being set up. What it was, it was a line from the movie Blade Runner. Her answer betrayed her as a replicant. You can probably sit down there, the bottom there. You're a replicant, a cyborg, not human. Maybe, though, there is a beating heart in there. Here she is replying to a charge that National sank the MMP review. Teddykins, 
Teddykins, often calling you Teddykins, is she, uh, Corin? No, um, but boy, she's showing a, a fair degree of boldness and um, risk-taking behaviour, which suggests she's certainly making herself in the running um, come the next leader of the National Party, she I would think. She uses Twitter <laughs> well, though, because she actually uses it for a bit of humour as well yeah. as just putting out boring yep. old policy that's, stuff. That's true, but she does, she models herself on Margaret Thatcher, and I'm not sure if Thatcher would have been a very good leader <laughs> under MMP, where you need to consult and negotiate, and we've seen this week that obviously Obviously, Judith is not particularly good at that. Um, so um, it, it remains to be seen whether she'll ever be the. But the very leader. confident, though, you know, very, very confident, confident in her own mind. Yes, yeah. yes. Oh, because she shut, shut the MMP yeah. down, didn't she? Yeah. Just stuck to yeah. her line. What's coming up this week? Well, we're really going to see the government go out and sell this budget, and Bill English will be on the road doing speeches. That will be the focus. It's recess. So really expect the government to, to batten down a little bit and really go out and sell that budget hard. Very good. Thank you very much to the panel. Raymond Miller, Sue, Br Sue Bradford and Oliver Hartwich. All right, investigates next with what the budget means for Māori plus Naitahu's role in the Christchurch rebuild. Thank you for watching and thank you for your contributions. Those were the questions, those were the answers. That's Q&A. We will see you next Sunday morning.